Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 320. This time I'm going to talk about this record from 1958 by Gil Evans, released on World Pacific Records, aka Pacific Jazz. Uh, this is a 1958 first mono pressing. So this is what you might call a progressive big band record, or some people call it a third stream record. That's some kind of fusion of jazz and classical. I find it kind of tricky to pin down. It's similar in a lot of ways to the records that Evans did with Miles Davis, but there are also some important differences. The most important one, of course, is that Miles Davis is not playing on here. The soloist is Cannonball Adderley, and it's actually kind of an unusual gig for Cannonball, a strange pairing. I think it works, but it's not necessarily obvious for Cannonball to get involved in this. In a review a couple of months ago, I discussed Gil Evans' early career when I was talking about his 1961 release, Out of the Cool. And the highlights of that are he follows Claude Thornhill to New York in the early 1940s. He works with Thornhill doing some very interesting arrangements, which, first of all, put him in contact with people like Jerry Mulligan and Lee Konitz and some other really quite thoughtful musicians. But his arrangements for Thornhill also attract the attention of Miles Davis. And out of all of that ferment emerges the recordings in 1949 and 1951, which are known as the Birth of the Cool Sessions. In the first half of the 1950s, Evans then goes on to make what money he can as an arranger, as a composer, as a performer. But his career then takes a serious upturn in 1956, when Miles Davis, who has now been signed to Columbia, is asked by his producer, George Avakian, if he'd like to do something a little bit different, if in fact he'd like to work with an arranger. On the one hand, this was kind of an inventive thing for Avakian to propose, but it was also a bit of an act of desperation because Miles, having signed for Columbia, was also making lots of noises about actually wanting to quit the jazz scene altogether and going into teaching and so on. So Avakian is trying to keep Miles interested. This was a way to keep Miles interested because Miles suddenly thought, hey, here's a way I could work again with Gil Evans, who was a person, one of the few people, arguably, that Miles really felt was his musical equal. So he says to Avakian, absolutely, let's get Gil Evans in here. Miles and Evans go on to do a series of really well-regarded recordings, very you know, landmark recordings, actually, the first of which was their recording Miles Ahead. Evans was the arranger. He was the conductor of the orchestra and identified a lot of the musicians he wanted as well. He also did some of the composing, whereas Miles was essentially the featured soloist, rather like the violinist in a violin concerto. Like this record, it was progressive big band, and it was enormously well-received. And if you flip through, for instance, copies of Downbeat from 1957 or 1958, you find all kinds of references to Gil Evans this and Gil Evans that, and can't we do something in kind of a Gil Evans way? And in fact, Downbeat had to create a whole new category for their reader polls, their annual reader polls, because there was no category for them, so they added the category of composer. So in short, Miles Ahead had made Gil Evans a star, but he wasn't exactly the kind of person who was quick to capitalize on that. He was not particularly entrepreneurial as a person. He really was an artist artist. He was a notoriously slow worker. So he wasn't necessarily about to grasp a lot of this opportunity himself, but thankfully it wasn't up to him to make the next move because George Avakian, who had been his producer for Miles Ahead, had left Columbia Records and had an opportunity to buy out a portion of Dick Box label Pacific Jazz, which he does, and he becomes the co-owner of Pacific Jazz. Pacific had been quite successful. Bach couldn't handle all the production duties himself. And once Avakian and Bach had shaken hands on the deal, one of the very first things that Avakian does at Pacific is get hold of Gil Evans and sign him to a two-record deal. This record is made over a series of sessions in the spring of 1958, April 9th, and then again May 2nd, May 21st, and May 26th. Avakian is the producer, and although it's a Pacific Jazz recording, or a World Pacific recording, it's not actually made in California like most of those recordings. It's actually recorded in New York at a studio, the name and location of which my own research skills have proved uh, insufficient to determine. I can tell you that it's a mono recording, and it's also recorded as a strobophonic recording. I don't actually know what a strobophonic record is. If you do know what a strobophonic record is, please do put a comment below. Clearly, the historical record tells us that strobophonic didn't really catch on. Gil Evans plays piano. He is the arranger. He is a composer here. Cannonball Adderley is the featured soloist on alto sax. And this being a big band record, there are 16 other musicians on here, not all playing at the same time, but usually the ensemble is something like 10 to 12 people. The most notable of those are probably the trumpeters Johnny Coles and Ernie Royal. Art Blakey, the well-known hard bop jazz drummer, he's replaced on one track by Philly Joe Jones, and the bassist, Paul Chambers. There are several other brass players on here, and probably the most substantial contribution is made by a guy called Frank Rahak, who plays a lot of the trombone solos. 
The concept is similar but different from Miles Ahead. It's similar in that Evans is stitching together a number of tracks, most of which are pre-existing compositions, in fact all of them are here, into a cohesive whole, a kind of suite underneath the featured soloist. And the orchestration will be very familiar to you if you've listened to Out of the Cool or Miles Ahead. It's got a lot of Evans-like flourishes, particularly the use of muted trumpets as an accent piece. But there's a whole other concept that Evans has here, which is basically kind of a history of jazz, because many of the giants of both pre-war and immediate post-war jazz are represented here as composers. Those include W.C. Handy, Jelly Roll Morton, Louis Armstrong, Prez, Monk, Dizzy, Bird. So you've got basically Evans taking us through about 40 years worth of music. Another main difference is the contrast in kind of warmth and mood and feel between Adderley's playing and Miles's playing. And finally, there's at least one production quirk, which compared to those other records, Miles Ahead and Out of the Cool, on this record, don't really do the musicians justice. Both sides of this record have four tracks. All these tracks are well-known jazz standards. They would have been well-known as songs to listeners in the 1950s. And they're woven together by Evans into kind of a cohesive whole, or a sort of cohesive whole. Sometimes you get the feeling there's a little bit of a, well, it's an unfinished nature to some of these. The record starts off with St. Louis Blues, which begins with this bluesy blast from Cannibal, who frankly is just fantastic all the way through here. There's that orchestral accompaniment with a lot of muted brass, which again is kind of an Evans signature. Um, this is the track, probably more than any of the others, which just seems to kind of circle the drain at the end, and you're kind of waiting for something to happen. And then another track starts, but it didn't feel as if the ideas had really been wrapped up from the first one. Next is King Porter Stop. As regular viewers of this channel would know, I'm not the hugest big band fan, and I've been wondering why this is, and I think it's because I'm just not that fond sonically of the sound of big sort of massed brass instruments, and there's a lot of that here. Um, but I will say this is a very interesting arrangement, and that's just, again, my own particular quirk. Willow Tree is a track that Philly Joe Jones comes in on drums and has some excellent soloing from Cannonball. The final track on side one is Strutton with some barbecue, which begins with what I think is a tuba solo and then some very tasty trombone. And then you get a really tasteful piece of playing from Cannonball. But the problem here, and I mentioned this production quirk, is that he sounds like he's recorded at the end of a hallway. He's either drowned in reverb or he's in some enormous gymnasium a long way from the mic. Either way, it compares poorly, I think, to the sound that Avakian got from Miles on Miles Ahead, and it compares poorly, I think, to the work that Creed Taylor did on Out of the Cool. Side 2 starts with Lester Leaps In, which has some great trombone soloing. I'm a little unconvinced by the rest of the arrangement, which seems kind of busy. But I really like the next track, which is Round Midnight, which of course is a monk tune. And this is an interesting track for a couple of reasons. First of all, Evans' own playing is kind of a tribute to Monk's slightly off-kilter piano style. And secondly, the whole arrangement by the orchestra flirts a little bit with discordance in much the same way that Monk's own performances do. On top of these stylistic tributes, the playing of Evans and Adderley is also excellent on this track. Then we get to Dizzy's Manteca, that really sort of driving, enthusiastic Afro-Cuban track. This is a really interesting arrangement because it starts off with a very gentle, almost wistful introduction to what is like a super high energy, upbeat song. It's funny now to hear that famous riff treated that way. In fact, it would have been funny then too. This is almost a bit played for laughs, I think. But it soon livens up and Cannonball's soloing on this track is probably his best on the record. The record closes with Charlie Parker's Bird Feathers, where Cannonball, again, seems like he's recorded at such a distance that it's kind of hard actually to pick up the nuances in his playing. Ray Hack and Coles, however, offer excellent solos. They're actually much better recorded than, than the main soloist actually is. And as a final treat, we get an arco bass solo from Paul Chambers. As I've said throughout, the obvious comparison points to this record are Miles Ahead and Out of the Cool. Avakian produced the first of those, Creed Taylor produced the second of those, and both of them, in my view, are superior in terms of their production. The other kind of mixed report for this record is that although Evans's arrangements are, as always, kind of interesting and often very quirky and fascinating, some of them seem kind of unfinished. But all that said, this is another fascinating entry in Evans's catalog of third screen recordings, which are neither purely cool jazz or purely big band or purely modal or what have you. He's kind of his own thing, kind of like Mingus is his own thing. It's musician's music, but a really intriguing example of that, and the layers of this record reveal themselves to you over time. For me, it's three and a half out of five stars.